<laughs> so um, welcome everyone. Hope you had a nice break. Um, we're now moving on to what I know is going to be a really fascinating discussion, which I think will just, you know, further open up some of the things that have already been discussed significantly. Um, the panel's called Terror Tools, Screen Horror Case Studies in Higher Education Teaching. So obviously focusing on exploring how horror texts provide ideal examples for teaching broader concepts in screen studies, uh, which is something we've already started to, to think about a little. And we've got these brilliant case studies from our five panellists. So without further ado, uh, we're going to have five lightning talks from our speakers. They're then there's then going to be some discussion between them and then we'll open it to questions and comments from the audience. So. First of all, I um, uh, have the pleasure of welcoming a regular contributor to BAFSIG events, Dr. Stella Gaynor, who's a senior lecturer in media, culture and communication at Liverpool John Moores, and of course is the author of Rethinking Horror in the New Economies of Television. She's also published works exploring the global spread of The Walking Dead, serial killer narratives on contemporary television, and true crime documentary and podcasting. And the title of her talk today is Screen Queens, Teaching the Impact of Television's Industrial Conditions on Narrative and Form. So over to you, Stella. Thanks, Kate. OK, I'm going to try this uh, sharing PowerPoint again and see what happens. Are we good? Yes. We're seeing it. Fabulous. Yes. Right. OK, so thanks for having me, as, as usual, <laughs> again. Um, so I teach on Level 5 Media Institutions and another module called Analyzing Entertainment Media. So specifically for this talk, um, I'm going to consider how I open up and then unpack the structures of contemporary US television. So key to this is that TV is always shifting and always absorbing new technologies, new trends and new viewing habits. So I want to talk about a case study that I use to teach this to students and get the students to think about how they watch TV and how industry shapes how they watch TV and what they watch on TV. So I use Screen Queens, as the title suggests, which is a two season slasher comedy from Fox in 2015 to function as a working example to demonstrate the following, to demonstrate the US TV industry and its strategies, the development of new programming according to the needs of advertiser supported TV networks and development of new programming according to um, the broader needs of television trends and then considering this as horror, what the impact this has on the disreputable slasher subgenre. So Fox, the channel, targets a younger demographic and it brands itself as being bright and edgy. Network channels themselves operate by selling a particular audience demographic to the advertisers. Now, for decades, this model was measured by the overnights, figures released by Nielsen that tell us how many people in which demographic watched and tuned in live, and the most coveted demographic being the 18 to 45 year olds. So in 2015, US TV was enjoying a glut of horror drama, which you can read about in my book, and Fox brings in Ryan Murphy to make Screen Queens, a slasher filled with a high profile cast that you can see here from Nickelodeon, the Disney Channel, pop music from Broadway and from horror film with Jamie Lee Curtis. So Fox and their bright and edgy branding are not intending to create premium style horror drama like Hannibal, for instance, but instead to develop their own addition to the horror trend through pop culture. Now, slashers have a long-standing and disreputable image that a slasher should make its way onto TV, advertiser-supported TV, is the key point that I make with this case study in developing students' understanding of the inner workings of the TV industry and its entertainment products. So Fox are leaning on several different factors from across the industry and current trends. So horror was having a moment, Ryan Murphy could do no wrong, he'd made Glee, an American horror story, and the star-studded cast would entice the younger 18 to 45 demographic who the students fall into that are coveted by the advertisers. <clears throat> now Fox had a lead time of nine months to promote Screen Queens. As each cast member was announced, their social media would light up with their announcements, catching that younger demographic who might follow Ariana Grande or Nick Jonas, whoever he is on Instagram. So for the students that I teach, this becomes a key talking point. Why this cast for a slasher? So it's made clear here that Fox and US TV is making use of other media platforms to promote its new programme development. There's no need to fight the internet. In fact, Fox can use the internet to bring in the younger demographic to watch Screen Queens in the hopefully big numbers from the premiere in September 2015. 
So Screen Queens is a slasher and demonstrates many of the codes and conventions of the slasher genre that we know. So it's got the inciting incident, the baby in the bathtub in this case, and the first handful of kills presented as very complex set pieces muddy the waters as to who the killer might be. So for students examining narrative and form, in episodes one and two, Screen Queens quickly sets up these narratives, forms and styles that we expect from a slasher and from a serialisation. So it's a slasher with all the expected slashing. It's a whodunit, which is perfect for serialization. And it's a comedy that features a star-studded cast, which is perfect for the Fox brand. It's a Ryan Murphy vehicle, who by 2015 is essentially TV royalty. And it's a slasher horror, but it's a slasher horror soaked in pastel colors and designer labels. Now these labels and brands are placed and sometimes paid for by the advertising industry that funds and supports Fox as a network channel. So in the module where I talk about media institutions and their strategies and means of making money, product placement is one of the things that we talk about. So in Screen Queens, we can see Chanel, of course, and Fendi, Gucci, Valentino. And then for the younger viewers who maybe can't afford such luxury, Topshop, Zara and Dr. Martins also appear. Now, one of the pledges, Jennifer, you can see there, she's a candle vlogger and their diptyque candles are then in a product placement later used to stage her corpse. So I use Screen Queens as a working example to demonstrate the inner workings of the Fox network to demonstrate how channels take on trends and develop them to fit their particular brand. So we have a slasher into a pastel coloured label soaked whodunit series for network demonstrating Fox strategy to develop its programming that is on trend, meets the channel brand, meets the needs of advertisers, contains product placement and in this case becomes a vehicle in which Fox could map out their model for the continuing changing landscape of TV. We're considering TV institutions, looking at how it's always changing. So while the show was much hyped, the premiere had only 4 million viewers when watched live for a network that's not good. On the Live Plus 3 ratings, this increased by 80%. Nielsen now counts these numbers to accommodate the changing habits of audiences, especially the younger demographics, those coveted by the advertisers and the students that I'm teaching this to. So in short, it's not about broadcast anymore, and that's not really how our students watch TV now anyway. So Fox used Screen Queens to spin their premiere loss to show how 62% of the Screen Queens audience watched away from the linear schedule, reducing the importance of the overnight figures and the long-standing reliance of both networks and advertisers on the traditional metrics of television. So through Screen Queens then, Students can see how conditions of media institutions shape and twist existing genres to meet strategic, strategic demands and the students' own viewing habits. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stella. Um, lots of food for thought there for, for the later discussion. We'll now move on to our second lightning talk, uh, and that's from Craig Mann. So Dr. Craig Ian Mann, is lecture in film and media at Sheffield Hallam University, where he teaches undergraduate degrees in media studies and film production. Uh, his current research focuses on anti-capitalist themes in American horror. And he is, of course, the co-convener of the Fear 2000 conference series and co-editor of the new 21st century horror book series at Edinburgh University Press. Um, Craig's uh, lightning talk is entitled The Stylist, using horror shorts to illustrate theoretical approaches to film. So over to you, Craig. Thank you very much. Let's just share this. And I'm just going to turn my camera off while I'm talking to save bandwidth. Okay, um, hello. So this talk is going to discuss a seminar task that uses a short film, uh, so 2016's The Stylist, to illustrate theoretical approaches to film. So... To give some brief context, I used this film on a first year module for film production students. So there are two things to note here. Firstly, our production students come from a range of backgrounds and often have no formal education in film. So we're building their skills from the ground up, basically. And secondly, this is the only module that our students study in their first semester and is divided into three strands. So film theory, project development and practical skills training. These three strands are designed to interact and interlock so that the skills learned on each are transferable to the others. And the overarching connection between them is theme. So my teaching on the theory strand is designed to get students thinking about the work of other practitioners. Uh, the idea being that as they learn to deconstruct subtext, they develop the skills needed to embed thematic meaning into their own work. So it introduces in four week blocks, film analysis, film narrative and film theory. 
So moving on to horror shorts, I use a lot of shorts on this module and there are a couple of reasons for this. So firstly, our students spend the majority of their time at university making shorts. So it's important that they understand the workings of short films as a distinct art form. Secondly, it allows me to embed research led teaching into the theory strand. Many of the films I use intersect with my own research. And finally, horror is obviously a thematically rich genre that tackles complex themes. And finally, finally, at the risk of ad-libbing, going back to something we were saying at the, the, the start of this conference, uh, I actually only get three screening slots on this module. So using shorts is a way of uh, making sure that we can show more case studies. To provide a synopsis for this particular case study, it focuses on a hairstylist attending to a wealthy businesswoman during an, an evening shift. Um, after a conversation in which the client treats her with contempt, the stylist then drugs the client and scalps her before wearing her hair in order to kind of crudely assume her identity. So I initially used the stylist in the first lecture for this module as an example designed to show students how to extrapolate meaning from mise-en-scene. So my current research focuses on anti-capitalism in American horror. So I deconstructed the film through a Marxist lens, showing how class conflict is communicated through set design, props, costume and performance. What I found in the seminar, though, is that the students didn't necessarily agree with me. Um, some were convinced by my class analysis, but others saw it more as a film about gender, while others were just kind of grossed out by it. So I was inspired to build upon that informal discussion, and now I use the film in the last week of the module in a task that encourages my students to bring together the skills that they've learned over 11 weeks studying the basics of film analysis, narrative, and theory. So what I do is first I show the film, and then I divide the cohort into four groups, and each group is then assigned one of four theoretical approaches that they've previously studied. And they're asked to apply it to the stylist using their analytical skills to draw meaning from its aesthetic and narrative form. So those approaches are, so first of all, feminist film theory or what the film has to say about gender, Marxist film theory or what the film has to say about class and power structures, effect theory or how the film elicits a physical or emotional response from the viewer, and formalist film theory, which is in essence a kind of control group as they're free to interpret the film however they like using the kind of formal analysis skills that we learned at the start of the module. I then give them 30 minutes to put together a cohesive argument, which they then report back to the class at the end of the session. And their aim is to show how the film can be interpreted through a particular theoretical lens. Now, the arguments that are presented differ from year to year. And I always receive nuanced responses to the film that argue passionately for why it should be seen as a comment on class or gender, or just as a very effective and affective horror movie. And the interesting thing about running this task using a film that's only 13 minutes long is that the students often use the same evidence to support their arguments and simply interpret that evidence in a different way to meet their needs. And relatedly, what's really interesting is that the formalist group usually comes to the conclusion that the film is thematically complex and really needs to be seen as an effective horror film that is also a comment on class and gender. So what this task does on a basic level then is give production students practical experience of analysing a film through a theoretical lens to understand its themes and subtexts, bringing together the skills that they've learned across this module. But it also has a few other outcomes. So firstly, it illustrates plural interpretation and the complexity of subtext, that great films are rarely about just one thing and that audiences can read them against the filmmaker's intention if they want to. Secondly, it builds on discussions that we've had earlier on, earlier in the module about how best to make shorts, and particularly Richard Raskin's idea that short films are driven by simplicity and depth, that the simpler a concept is, the more you invite a viewer to imprint their own meaning upon it. And finally, it makes clear that genre films can function as the genre films, while also carrying deeper thematic meaning. As a final point, uh, a feature length sequel to The Stylist was produced in 2019, so next year I intend to extend this task by following it with a screening of the feature and a discussion of how those themes are developed in a full length narrative. But that's it from me for now, so thank you very much for listening and what I will do just before I finish um, is I will paste a link to the film in the chat if anybody wants to watch it after this session. Cheers. That's great. Th thank you, Craig. And, um really fantastic task um, I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about with regards to that later. Uh, as we all know Dr Laura Mee is a senior lecturer in film and television at the University of Hertfordshire um, her research focuses on horror adaptation seriality. She's the author of course of the recently published Reanimated the Contemporary American Horror Remake and a Devil's Advocates on The Shining in 2017. Uh, she's the co-editor of the Liverpool University Press series Hidden Horror Histories, which we've already 
given a shameless plug to uh, earlier on, and is, of course, the co-founder and co-convener of the BAFT Horror Study SIG. And as you can see from the slide, her uh, lightning talk today is entitled Get Out, Teaching Popular Horror, Representation and Genre Hybridity. Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Kate. Um, hopefully everybody can, can see this, just shout if not. Um, OK, so the enduring popularity of Jordan Peele's 2017 film Get Out with horror and general audiences alike has unsurprisingly translated to its regular inclusion on film studies courses. And over the past five years, I've seen Get Out mentioned by HE practitioners as part of their syllabi on both horror modules and other film studies units. Um, so I'm not making any claims to empirical data collection here, uh, but even just a cursory search on, uh, on Twitter highlights how popular the film has become as a teaching tool. And especially notable, I think, is not just the film's ubiquity in film teaching at HE level, but also its adaptability. You can see from some of these examples here the really wide range of ways that Get Out has been engaged within a teaching and learning context. It's been used to address social and cultural contexts, political division, issues of gender and class, and most obviously and unsurprisingly, given the film's central themes, it's clearly a great tool for discussing race, racism and representation. Anecdotally, I'm sure that Kate won't mind me saying that she's set Get Out on her horror module when looking at representation in modern US horror, where students engage with it really well. I know Tom uses it when teaching critical race theory, and I also know that Craig has used it as an example of horror's political relevance um, and really benefits from students' familiarity with it uh, so that he can use it as a jumping off point for looking at other topics such as economics. It's also used as an example in teaching genre, uh, and we also see its application in the teaching of a variety of stylistic and formal elements, as well as on practical filmmaking courses. So looking at everything from screenwriting craft to editing and scoring, and perhaps the ultimate example of Get Out's inclusion in HE teaching was by Tanana Reeve Du, um, who's a notable screenwriter herself, obviously, but also teaches at UCLA and brought Jordan Peele in for a class on the sunken place and black horror cinema. My own adoption of Get Out in the classroom has straddled a couple of these different areas. Now, I set the film as part of a syllabus on a first year level four module called Introduction to Film and Television Histories and Contexts. And that's a pretty convoluted title for what's effectively a very broad rudimentary core module. It's part of a practice based course with the emphasis very much on filmmaking and the film and TV industries and those of us who teach on the academic side of things on the programme are often challenged by both the very little space that we have to explore film theory, history, culture and context, but also the enthusiasm that some of our students have or often don't have for this side of their subject. So Get Out was my choice uh, screening case study for a single week on genre studies on this module. Teaching this unit comprises a lecture in which I provided an outline of genre theory, evolutionary models, models of genre like those from Schatz and Ginetti, before applying these to a case study of the historical development of horror cinema, um, which led to a discussion of genres possibilities for political, cultural and social commentary. And this provides context for screening Get Out. The lecture and screening is supported um, with a, uh, a general reading around genre theory and a piece on Get Out as well. And then a few days later, students discuss the film in seminars. Horror, work, horror works really well as a case study for understanding genre, I think, because it's at once very easily recognisable in terms of its tropes, iconography, codes, conventions. But it's also obviously a genre that is very slippery to try and define. It relies largely on subjective classification and emotional response, and so it challenges established genre theory. Now, I found that despite its status as a significant contemporary horror film, students were really quick to label Get Out as a sci-fi film or even to see it as more of a comedy. And the film offers an especially interesting way to look at horror hybridity from this perspective. And in the class, students uh, had the opportunity to think more critically about some of the complexities of generic modes and, and classifications and definitions. And this also gave us a good opportunity to explore the impact of genre on critical and audience reception and to get students thinking about issues around awards recognition and canonization. Get Out was, of course, Oscar nominated, which is rare for horror films, but was also nominated quite controversially in the musical or comedy categories at the Golden Globes, which you can see um, a response to just there. Um, 
picking up from the lecture's outline of the genre's possibility for addressing political, social and cultural concerns, uh, students were also able to apply this to an interesting discussion on Get Out's themes, connecting what they already knew about the film and its clearly scathing critique of white liberal US racism to other genre examples, as well as developing more nuanced analyses of the film's other genre leanings. So for example, how it updates Body Snatchers narratives in order to make new, new social commentary. Overall then, Get Out provided an engaging and accessible example which was familiar to students and allowed them to, to kind of explore various approaches and understandings, but it did so relatively organically with students taking the lead on addressing the film's thematic concerns and its formal and stylistic qualities, in addition to exploring uh, questions of genre, which for me was of course its primary use as a case study. Um, and that's me done, thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, fascinating. And I don't know if you've seen, but there's some really interesting comments in the chat about how other, other uh, people have been using Get Out. Really, really interesting. I'm sure we can oh, draw on that later. Yeah. Uh, uh, Shelley, are you able to go now? Is the PowerPoint um, okay? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Okay, um, no worries at all. Shut no down. No worries at all. Um, so I have the pleasure now of introducing my other uh, Baths Horacig uh, co-convenian, that's uh, Dr Shelley McMurdo, who's a lecturer in film and television at the University of Hertfordshire, um, the co-editor of Hidden Horror Histories, and of course the co-founder and convener of the Baths Horror Studies SIG. She's the author of two forthcoming books, Hat Cemetery and Blood on the Lens, which we, uh, we have a book launch for coming up as part of the SIG. And her uh, presentation today uh, is called The Sacrament Teaching Trauma with T West. So over to you, Shelley. Lovely, thank you. Um, so to give you all a little bit of background, I teach an optional research-led specialist module, which is offered to film production students in their second year. Um, and this module is called Trauma on Screen. So the intention of my module is to give students an introduction as to how film and television text can function as spaces to address, to work through and to discuss cultural trauma and societal anxieties as well. Um, so here are some of the other case study screenings that are either used on the module or might be used on the module next time I run it. And these can all be used as in ways to discuss a variety of topics like grief, national trauma, historical trauma, moral panics, true crime, and wound culture. So definitely not all horror there, but a fair amount of it, because horror is a really useful and good genre to teach trauma studies with, uh, for a few different reasons, which hopefully will become clear. So <clears throat> obviously there are tons of different horror films and TV shows you can use um, to focus on, to discuss various traumas and anxieties, but the one that I wanna focus on today is The Sacrament, which is also my favourite film of all time. So for those of you unfamiliar with The Sacrament, it is a film from 2013 directed by Ty West, and it's basically a modern retelling of the Jonestown Massacre. So that's a real life event, for those of you who don't know, where 918 people died in a mass murder suicide. And it's a particularly interesting case study to use on the module because it was heavily criticised when it was released for using that real life traumatic event as a basis for a story, but failing to name that event within the narrative. So for an example of some of those criticisms, Manola Dargis of the New York Times called the film a pointless, abjectly impersonal recreation of mass death. Catherine Hill uh, noted on the jonestown.edu website that it was grotesque and inappropriate. Meanwhile, Alan Almakar of the MacGuffin argued that it was unapologetically exploitative. And journalist Sam Costello proposed that using real life horror as a basis for fictional horror is offensive. So one of the reasons that the sacrament is a really useful tool is because of those criticisms. It lends itself well to a variety of different discussions and debates, but particularly the ethics of using real life trauma in fictional formats. So these are some examples of various discussion questions that I've presented to students. Um, so we can have debates around the position of the horror genre within wider cinema and how it can function as a traumatic space. We can talk about preconceptions around the genre, mainly that it's kind of um, thought of as too brash and too kind of vulgar a genre to sensitively deal with trauma. 
And this works really well as I find that horror is a genre that students, whether they're fans of horror or not, they tend to have a strong opinion on the genre. Um, and also we tend to have debates over whether or not there are limits to traumatic representation. If there are limits, then how do we navigate those in our analysis of film, but also as their production students in the production of films and television shows too. Uh, given the age of my students, I've also used the Sacrament and other found footage horror films to set up discussions around how in contemporary society, we now often view different traumas and different world events through someone else's lens. And as I said, an important thing to note here is that I teach production students. So only 25% of their in-class time is theory-based with the other 75% being practice-based. But The Sacrament is a really good film to use with this in mind as it brings up kind of specific uh, production or industry focused discourses. So we can talk about the film's found footage framing, why they might use that kind of um, framing in their own creative practice, and also what kinds of narratives and ideas that would work well with. And we can, coming back to the criticism The Sacrament received for using a real life event as a basis for its story, talk about the responsibility of filmmakers in representing the quite recent past. And it's kind of fun teaching practice-based students because not only can we have extended discussions and debates around these kind of questions um, and hopefully make them more kind of reflexive filmmakers, but we can also work, workshop more practice-based ideas as well. So this is an example of a workshop task that I set them uh, around after we watched a screening of the sacrament. So through these kinds of ideas, they can explore the position of found footage horror filmmaking within the wider horror genre, examine how they could utilize elements of it and get them thinking more broadly about reality aesthetics and how to manipulate the real within their own work. The Sacrament then is not only a very rich film to analyze and allow students to have these vital debates over trauma and representation of trauma, but it also enables them to go beyond that and think about the construction of the real within the Sacrament the representation of real life trauma and how that plays into their own filmmaking practice. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Shelley. And, and really interesting that that theory practice issue keeps coming up in different permutations throughout um, the day so far. I'm sure it's something we return to in lots of different ways. And that was a really fascinating contribution to discussion about that, uh, Shelley. So, we're now moving on, last but not least, to our last lightning talk of this panel, uh, which is from Tom Watson. So Dr. Tom Watson is Senior Lecturer in Transmedia uh, Research at Teesside University. Uh, his current research is focused on the confluence between music subcultures and genre cinema. Uh, he's a co-editor with Craig of the 21st Century Horror Book Series published by Edinburgh University Press. And as you can see, the title of his talk today is The House That Jack Built, Teaching Transgression and Extremity at the Boundaries of Popular Culture. Over to you, Tom. Cheers, Kate. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, yes. Just, okay, yes, cool. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just jump straight into it then. Okay, so situated in the level five critical theory module, popular culture and context, uh, which I teach at Teesside University, um, this particular seminar is designed to challenge preconceived notions of cultural value and worth via the examination of texts that are considered culturally extreme or particularly transgressive. So initially this session was a way to engage in research informed teaching, building on my own work, looking at confluences between horror cinema and hardcore pornography, independent hardcore horror cinema from the US and also areas of transgression afforded to cult cinema more broadly. The module itself is essentially a theory object module where various examples of popular culture are examined using established and emerging cultural theory and related perspectives, which is perhaps fairly self-explanatory. To this end, the module strives to pair set readings with an example of audiovisual media to anchor the analysis and also to allow students to consider familiar examples in new and creative ways. So one of the main tenets of this particular module is to contest what is meant by the term popular and interrogate how certain cultural objects can challenge or at the very least problematize notions of cultural value, cultural capital and worth. 
This particular session is run in the early stages of the module, typically in week three, once the core ideas and approaches to popular culture have been established and discussed. And it is also relevant to note that the module is run alongside another module called Case Studies and Censorship, discussing such films as Straw Dogs, Irreversible, David Cronenberg's Crash, and Base Moi. As such, students tend, tend to at least, if they turn up to sessions at least, um, some grounding in cinema considered extreme or contentious, or contentious in terms of censorship prior to engaging in other extreme material and relevant content warnings are announced accordingly. So in the last two iterations of this particular module, um, Lars von Trier's 2018 film, The House That Jack Built, has been used by myself as a case study in these sessions as a means of analysing representations of extreme human behaviour, so serial murder and graphic dismemberment, but also examples of extreme representation. And the film could loosely be grouped within the wider subgenre of serial killer cinema and the serial killer confessional, obviously very in vogue at the moment in, in different respects. So the idea for using this specific example actually originated from an in-media res curated week entitled The Problem with Post Horror, where my fellow panelists, all present and correct today, um, and myself uh, discussed contemporaneous examples of horror cinema that were crit critically heralded as elevated or prestige and highbrow. So discussions of Get Out are also apt here um, as well. So in my contribution in the series of provocations, what I went on to talk about was the house that Jack built as an example of cinema that was extreme in terms of representation, but also self-reflexive enough to be positioned within culturally determined boundaries of high art or horror e and exploitation. So the presence of Von Trier in his own film is interesting here in that he reflects on his wider body of work, but also moments of cultural agitation that he himself has instigated or at least caught it in his career. So the viewing of this particular film is pa paired with two specific pieces of work. Firstly, Joan Hawkins' 2000 work, Cutting Edge, Art Horror and the Horrific Avant-Garde. Um, in this book, Joan Hawkins is able to detail how the prevailing features of the 20th century avant-garde aesthetic are the breaking of taboo surrounding the depiction and performance of sex and violence, the desire to shock the bourgeoisie and the willful blurring of the boundary lines traditionally separating life and art. So the house that Jack built offers a cinematic consolidation of these points, not least as the titular Jack, played by Matt Dillon, acts as a cipher for Von Trier and asserts that some people claim that the atrocities we commit in our fiction are those inner desires which we cannot commit in our controlled civilization, so they're expressed through our art. The screening is also paired with the work of Chris Jenks, specifically his introductory work on transgression, and the idea that to transgress is to go beyond the bounds or limits set by a commandment or law or convention. It is to violate or infringe, but to transgress is also more than this. It is to announce and even laudate the commandment, the law or convention. Transgression is a deeply reflective act of denial and affirmation. So the cover of this book, um, which I sort of encourage students to, to, to get out of the library so they can kind of see it in its context, um, is also adorned with Marcus Harvey's 1995 work, Myra, which I've kind of put on the middle of the, the slide there, a painting presenting the recognisable visage of British child murder Myra Hindley, albeit controversially comprised of children's handprints. So this in itself is significant. As the seminar session has developed, students becoming interested in wider discussions around cultural provocation and culture as disruption, often contextualising their discussions around the 1997 Sensation exhibition at the London Royal Academy of Arts, during which Marcus Harvey's work was repeatedly attacked and vandalised. And this kind of practice, I guess, is something that Von Trier also uh, ruminates on in the house that Jack built. So transgression as a conceptual term is something students have not necessarily been formally introduced to before this module, at least on the iteration of the course that I teach. Um, and it is interesting to see how they engage with the terminology and application of these terms in both discussions, debates and assignments and often in their practical work as well. Students are asked to debate the boundaries of representation, the nature of transgression, and if we can ever consider examples of cinema or popular culture to be considered too much or pushing the boundaries too far. And several pieces of work that have emerged from this particular session have went on to discuss the relationship between transgression, temporality and offence, again questioning boundaries and potential barriers of taste and cultural value. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Tom. So I think I'm going to hand over to you guys now because I know you're going to <coughs> discuss your papers together. So over to all of you. Thanks, Kate. I think Stella um, has got the the first question, but I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed everybody's <laughs> everybody's talks. I thought they were um, very varied set of case studies. Um, and it was great to hear really different perspectives and, and different examples. Um, I think we've, we've basically, we each have a, a, a kind of question hoping that, that, they, that it kind of links our papers together um, and we'll see where that discussion goes and then we'll, we'll open up for questions um, to everybody else. But Stella, do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, thanks, Laura. So I do have the first question and yeah, would absolutely echo what you said, lots to think about there um, and certainly lots of seminar approaches to sort of take on board from, from my own teaching. So I'm going to kick off our our sort of, you know, in, inside the Q&A panel with thinking about how we're all horror specialists, but we're all teaching and using yeah. horror on modules that are not horror based. So what's what's the use of, of doing that? Um, and because I've asked the question, I'll kind of answer it first very broadly with one of the reasons that I introduce uh, particularly screen queens for thinking about US TV horror industry is that it's very accessible. So we were talking earlier in panels about students who might not necessarily be into horror, so maybe don't want to see anything too graphic or too, too hard to use screen queens is an accessible point for students to get in. And it's just something else to talk about with regards to TV industries that isn't Game of Thrones or Stranger Things or Peaky Blinders. You know, when on the rest of the module, I've talked about soap operas and Crime Watch and all these other much more, you know, calmer, run of the mill things. For me, bringing in something like Screen Queens is a good accessible point. And it just gives the students another genre or another thing for them to think about and to critically apply when they come to do their essays or seminars, like Tom said, when they turn up. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm gonna follow on, I'm gonna dive in and, and follow on mainly because um, I, I think, you know, obviously I'm, I'm teaching, I, my, my case study was Get Out and obviously it, it's, you know, extremely popular. And one of the reasons why I show it, um, I, I didn't talk about this quite so much, but obviously the, the, the fact that it's, um, Firstly, very accessible in terms of not being uh, not being particularly controversial, not being you know particularly um, uh, uh, concerning for students who don't like horror. In terms of, we often get asked about you know it, it, like they ask about jump scares all the time, or they ask about you know animal death and various other things. And and obviously there's there's a there's a little bit of that in Get Out, but in terms of other things that I could show I actually think it's it's quite tame from a, a kind of visceral level Th thematically um it's 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 you know deeply frightening um but I think that that gives them plenty of opportunity to think about horror in terms of thematic um in terms of thematic ways rather than just aesthetic ways um I also pick get out because it's very popular and I think that you know trying to engage students uh, with a genre that some of them are apprehensive about, I think can be quite challenging. And so uh, picking something that is that is a quite recent, um, b that many of them will have perhaps seen but taken at face value and and give them the opportunity to think about it a little bit more deeply. Um, and see that even if they haven't seen it, they're probably very familiar with the kind of context around it and the discourses that exist around Get Out, which which feel which which then means that none of them feel like they're off on the wrong foot with it. There's all there's some level of familiarity even if they haven't seen it. So I guess for me that's the that's the one. I think like following on from that as well. I think one of the things that links a lot of our talks together is is the fact that that the horror is often about what we're afraid of, and. Uh, I find that when I'm teaching sort of basic film analysis and, and you know, because what I'm talking about here is a, a first year module, um, first semester, often with students who've got no no practical experience of, of studying film at all, that it's easier for them to kind of break down and analyse movies when they can, that they can sort of see the theme on a somewhat surface level. <laughs> and I think with a lot of horror, it's it's playing to what we are afraid of in the, in the, in the real world. And we're gonna, I know we're gonna come back to that with a later question. Um, I think another thing for me as well is that because I'm teaching production students, we're, we're opening up uh, a, a whole world they might wanna go into in that there's a whole dedicated festival circuit for horror movies 
um, and getting them familiar with the genre and how to, to make films in the genre and how films in the genre work um, will make them better practitioners and therefore make them uh, more likely to get into those festivals and kind of launch their career. Um, and the third thing I would say as well is that we're all horror, horror scholars and I like to do research led teaching and it's it's a good idea I think to embed our own stuff in in what we're teaching and even if you're teaching on a, a module that doesn't necessarily intersect with with horror I can see that that you know Tom and Shelley's modules really clearly do intersect with horror but mine doesn't need to have any horror content at all if it doesn't need to but you know it's what I'm writing about and what I'm researching and I think it's important for students to be able to connect with us as researchers and see what it is we're doing so yeah yeah I agree I was going to say like kind of picking up from what Craig said about teaching production students I find horror a really useful thing to use because you know you want them to become good practitioners and you want them to kind of I, I find horror useful as a way of saying okay you might not like this genre but you need to start watching broader things you need to start getting ideas from different genres maybe ones that you don't necessarily enjoy or you you know you haven't really looked into before because that's going to make you a better filmmaker that's going to make everything about your films better if you look more broadly and take ideas from all different kinds of things so I think that's its use as well it's a very good a very useful tool to use to say okay look you might not enjoy this you might have never watched a horror film before but let's see what you can get out of it yeah i suppose last but not least i'll kind of uh, f follow up i think for me again sort of talking about teaching who for, for my cohorts does tend to be the kind of um majority of production students i think I tend to end up teaching them in their second or third years. And I do get the opportunity to kind of see some of the work that they are producing quite early on. Um, and to be quite honest, again, obviously giving students the benefit of the doubt, because often I think in first year, they're just kind of finding their own foot, uh, finding their own feet with, with the exploration of various kind of um, storytelling techniques and narrative and things like that. But I think for me, what 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 the value seems to be of kind of exploring the theory and then using horror as, as a way of kind of analyzing that and kind of going into a bit of a deeper dive is that you can kind of see that enriching the work that they're producing so they're not necessarily just producing run-of-the-mill zombie films or kind of serial killer slasher movies and things like that which do tend to be quite generic in the feedback that they're getting is like well what what is this doing differently what are your reference points kind of you know are you, are you looking at this through a postmodern lens are you kind of looking at this through gender and all that kind of stuff so it's it's kind of using using the theory to kind of enrich those particular modes of production i'm not saying that you know just because i teach transgression and horror cinema that all students are then going to go and make these really transgressive extreme horror movies because i think that would land them in hot water ethically further down the line in some respects um and there has been times when students have kind of came close to the wire with what they want to present on screen but it is kind of about contextualizing that i think and that that kind of makes me think about the way that i teach horror and it's not necessarily straightforward kind of you know this is a horror movie let's analyze it via genre and that's kind of what i do as well but it's like taking those concepts of transgression or whatever kind of theory that it might be it might be hauntology or something like that it might be capitalist realism um that's what i've kind of been prepping this week um delivering a lecture on some of the mark fisher stuff but how particular movies might be useful to explore those ideas um, so it's not just kind of crow boring horror texts in to modules just because, you know, Tom's the lecturer that likes showing us gruesome stuff. And that is part of it as well. By no means, I'm not going to kind of absolve myself of that. But but yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's my kind of contribution to that, I think. Yeah. Cool. Um, I mean, my question was kind of ties into Stella's. So we had that fantastic panel this morning where... Uh, Stacey and Kate and Lindsay discuss teaching horror specific modules but we're all people that are kind of horror specialists but trying to insert some horror into more general kind of broader modules so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on your kind of process of doing that so you know what what is your process of what films do you select what ones do you maybe go no nah, that's too much you know do you consciously limit as a horror specialist, how much horror you put into these more 
general modules. So how do you kind of get that balance right? So for example, uh, on the module that I was talking about, uh, trauma on screen, originally that was a 10 week module. And I kind of dotted in some horror throughout it and was like, that's enough, that's not too much. And then it got shortened to a five week one. And I was like, oh, I guess I can, I only want to put one horror film in because that like more than one in five weeks might be a bit too much for them. So I just wondered what your kind of process for doing that is. I, I certainly do limit how much horror I use. And I think it's it's partially just because I think this has come up a few times today. You don't know whether they're going to like horror and you can, and it's one of the few genres I think that can genuinely put students off um, if, if they're really, really, you know, um, reticent to watch horror movies. So I do try to, first of all, I use, I tend to now use horror films a little bit later in modules so I can kind of build up to it and I can prep them for it. Uh, and secondly, I do make sure that I use a, 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 a range of stuff. So I said in, the, in in my talk that I used to use the stylist on week one. And when I moved it to the task at the end, what I replaced it with was uh, Wes Anderson's Hotel Chevalier. So I went in completely the opposite direction to a very kind of twee love story. Right. Um, and I think it, it, it depends what you're using it for. And, and in my case, I'm kind of using short films to break down how we how we analyze movies. And I can do that with a lot of different films. So I think it is important when you're not teaching a horror based module that is about the theory and, and practice of horror, um, that you do make sure that you've got a balance and also that you make sure that you build up showing them horror films and give them time to get used to the idea. Uh, the first time I showed the stylist, I did have somebody who said to me, like, I, I did not enjoy that. And so the next year I gave a content warning and it went a lot better. But yeah. I do exactly the same thing. So like I said before, using tech, horror texts that are accessible, mainstream, that students might have seen before, so they're not going to be particularly shocked by anything. And like just giving them a run up to it. So I keep telling them, in week seven, we're going to do this. In week seven, so that's in Prepare 20 yourself. Time, <laughs> one week time. Next week, in 20 minutes, I'm going to show you this. Please don't kick off. And it's, for the most part, it's gone okay. Um, although I did have a student get up and walk out um, in the middle of a session where I was talking, what, what was I talking about? I was only I was talking about Slender Man. It wasn't even anything particularly wild. And I'd shown um, a, a clip from a Beware the Slender Man documentary. And it's the clip of some kids playing the eight pages. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit jumpy and she just went, nope. <laughs> and just left so even you know I'd done seven weeks of warnings and, and she was having none of it so you know it's just it's the trepidation and I perhaps wrongly assumed that everybody would have known what Slender Man is was and that it wasn't you know particularly you know with, with the kids today I thought they would have been all right with it and uh, mm -hmm. she, she never came back <laughs> it's, it's weird what causes what the only walkout I've ever had was I showed Twin Peaks I showed the new series of Twin Peaks and that was <laughs> I went as too a, far. As a, as a quick side point, I, I do often I do find that when you show horror stuff, you do make horror fans too. You have fans, the, the students who were never horror fans before, and you show them some stuff, and they're like, "Actually, this is a whole new world that I'm really enjoying." But anyway, yeah, Laura, and they come Laura to you Newton. and say, "They've come and said, have you got any more like that? Or is there anything else that I can watch that's similar?" And it's like, "Yes, of course." Yeah, I've yeah. asked them to. For, I've had students ask me to do like a list of recommendations, yeah, a list, and stuff like that. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, in, in terms of sort of knowing what students will and will not be happy to watch, one that really surprised me was Jaws. I had a, a student who who didn't who didn't want to watch Jaws um, and was was really frightened of the ocean, which I guess leads nicely into uh, into I think Tom's got a question about um, about um, uh, sort of handling sensitive content and what have you. But uh, obviously, I didn't anticipate that Jaws would be that sensitive content I thought that um you know that that was going to be much more some of the the really upsetting stuff that I was showing later down the line but it, it was it was a student who just really didn't want to see a big shark <laughs> which you know if if that's if that's how you feel then then I totally get it and I and I guess um uh in terms of in terms of selecting things I guess sometimes I lean towards kind of thrillers or things that maybe scared me a little bit when I was younger like Jaws um which I wouldn't necessarily deem as horror and wouldn't think of horror when I'm trying to think about that balance between horror and non-horror text on a on a module um so I think it's really interesting to to also kind of challenge your perspectives of what horror is I think what we decide is 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 sort of horror or not horror or or, or mild or, or not mild or might scare people yeah. or won't scare people you just can never actually know how people are going to respond to I it try I and do that thing as well where it's like I show American Psycho but if anyone asks for the purposes of including it in the module it's a thriller it's not horror yeah. film. I didn't put too much horror in it 
That's yeah, okay. exactly. Um, just just to say, sorry, sorry, I, I know I'm interrupting Tom, but just just to say before we um, before we go on, I've just agreed with Kate that we'll we'll run slightly over because obviously the the next panel is um, is is much shorter anyway. So we're going to run this um, uh, till sort of five two, just so we can talk for the next ten minutes. Then we've got ten minutes for questions. All right. I uh, so just just kind of before I ask my question, um, I'm just thinking about sort of my process of kind of selecting texts and the kind of way that I think about and I think I mentioned in my, my sort of my lightning talk that the module that I run that kind of incorporates a lot of kind of maybe the more extreme ends of horror is kind of ran alongside something called case studies and censorship so there's kind of a lot of horror content on that module just out of necessity because obviously I think a lot of the kind of main case studies around censorship do tend to be either horror cinema or exploitation or at least various sequences from those films could be considered in that way so i think it's kind of being conscious of the fact of not to not to like kind of overload not necessarily just like horror but kind of maybe the more again the, the more extreme or transgressive end of those types of representations and just because i researched that and i'm familiar with that it's always always need to be mindful that students are coming to this you know it's a second year of a university degree in kind of media and comms or film film and tv production they might just want to be shooting documentaries or do work in advertising so it's kind of it's thinking about that as well one of the one of the problems that i've kind of had in in recent years and this isn't necessarily just with horror cinema as well kind of selecting various examples is kind of like trying to think about reference points that students actually get so it's like if I'm trying to use niche examples of, I don't know, like Italian horror, like I think we mentioned before in the chat about, you know, people trying to one up people in terms of cultural capital. It's also kind of selecting stuff that either students are going to be familiar with to the extent that they've heard of a particular filmmaker, heard of a particular film or they can access it quite easily. Because the other thing is, like, we don't do screenings at Teesside Uni as kind of policy. So it needs to be either available on box of broadcasts or at least kind of on whatever streaming services that students can use. So that's also something that dictates what, what I can and can't teach, I guess. Um, the house that Jack built may be an exception because I was a bit naughty with that and kind of had a screening of that anyway. Um, but, yeah, so that that's kind of maybe the external factors kind of dictate that a little bit more anyway i'll stop rambling and i'm going to ask my question so i was kind of thinking about this and kind of had a few notes and i know we've kind of chatting about this so i've kind of tried to formulate it as a proper question so if it sounds really pretentious i'm really sorry um so this is kind of for everyone so i think one of the main issues i'd be interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on um is the introduction of often violence or maybe in my case i keep using this word extreme but like that type of content to students that don't always necessarily have any substantial grounding in that type of material and ways that we might go on to potentially manage sensitive content in the classroom. Um, so Craig, like you mentioned, Melanie Light's uh, The Herd, for example, which is really interesting in terms of representation of, of kind of sexualized violence and, and kind of you know animal cruelty alleg allegory and all that kind of stuff then obviously Shelley you're focusing on trauma studies and, and you mentioned like wound culture so I'm just kind of wondering how we might go on to manage that sensitive material in the classroom and maybe tapping into kind of ethical considerations as well if that makes sense it, it does make sense yeah um I, I I find I've got I have a little bit of an issue with this in that I I find that I don't think that something is particularly scary or transgressive or, or horrible. And then I show it to a class full of 18, 19 year olds and they massively disagree with me. Um, so I, yeah, I think the important thing is content warnings, which I've, you know, now I give content warnings for any, any horror movie I show. I mean, the, as I say, the first time I showed the stylist, I thought this is really actually quite tame. And I had a couple of students who were like, she tears a woman's scalp off and it's really graphic and horrible and I didn't like it I was like okay cool I'll make sure that I, I make that clear in future and I, I you know and I actually find that when you say this film has some upsetting content and here's what that upsetting content is actually very few students ever walk out I, I've barely ever seen that I've had a couple of students who didn't weren't great with with blood but I think it's in terms of the ethics of it Tom I think it's fine as long as you're making clear what it is that you're going to show and, and that did take me a year or so to figure out four or five years ago but then once you've I think once you've made that clear and students have had the opportunity to make that decision themselves then they can do i think the thing with the herd is it is um 
horrible. And I, I saw it at a film festival with no content warning whatsoever. And it actually did take me by surprise. It's one of the few kind of horror films, short or feature films that I've watched in a long time that really did unsettle me. But I think it's important, what, you know, I use it in, in classes to think about how you can very clearly build themes into a, into a movie. And obviously that, that movie's about feminism and veganism and um, lots of different things. And I think if you explain, it's partially about explaining why you're showing it and what, they did, what, what, what they're going to learn from it. And then also making clear what might be upsetting about it and then letting them make that decision themselves. Yeah, I find that like, with the sacrament, what we do is we kind of have on all of our module pages have kind of a very general content warning and encourage them to look on um, doesthedogdie.com and stuff like that so they can kind of make informed decisions and what I tend to do like especially with the sacrament is the week before because our um um they see like the same person every week so the week before I said to them you know next week we're gonna watch this film just to let you know it's based on a real life story it might be an idea to do a little bit of research around that before you watch it so you can decide if you want to see it or not and then we do kind of content warnings before the we screen the film and I give them a break. So if anyone doesn't want to watch the film, they don't have to do that awkward thing of coming downstairs and leaving. They can just not come back. Um, but I think ethically, it's a really interesting thing that we've all kind of mentioned it because we're horror people. What we think is offensive or too far or whatever is so completely different to what a lot of the students do. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to the point of uh, we're showing this stuff on oh. modules that aren't horror. So we need to be a bit more careful. But, you know, you can give all the content warnings that you want and all the trigger warnings and, you know, have a content warning in the module guide and a content warning on that week on Canvas and then a content warning in the lecture and then a content warning in the break before you show the clip. And it's like, I... I can't I can never predict how some how somebody might feel about something and you know where everybody's levels are are so so different one person might be afraid of ghosts another person doesn't want to see blood and I think as far as ethic goes we can just give them as much information as we can and consistently and hope that the students who need to respond to, to those warnings and those messages do so accordingly and that there is some onus on them to take responsibility for what they see and what they don't see, as well as us going, here's the content, here's where it's going to be. You don't have to watch it if you don't want to. Yeah, I, I, we've got a lot um, coming up later, haven't we, about content notices and and, and warnings and so on. So uh, and the sort of uh, the teaching compassionately, I, I think, is 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 really important. Um, but I think just to re-emphasize, I think like we've all said, it's 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 a it's a choice of. Um, uh, just sort of empowering personal decision and just letting students decide what's right for them and, and just being open to understanding that not everybody has the same kind of issues or, or, or the same kind of uh, the same kind of concerns um, and you know Shelley mentioned using does the dog die.com which people aren't familiar with it it's an absolutely fantastic resource because it's kind of it's it's kind of crowdsourced information about what films contain and it's everything from whether a, whether something contains kind of scenes of vomiting to somebody getting their head chopped off you know so so anything that you're not entirely sure about because one of the things with content warnings of course is that you can't you you know the reason I don't use the, the language trigger warnings is because you don't know what is going to trigger yeah. somebody you don't know what's going to be a problem for individuals so having um the the a resource like that is I think is is, is really really useful actually um did anybody have anything else that they wanted to, to uh, just come back it's kind of making me think think about like because the, the module that i've kind of taught has obviously been ongoing for the past i guess i think it's about three or four years and obviously that was kind of encountering online teaching and remote learning through covid and things like that and it's kind of making me think and i think that that particular iteration of the module I think I used a different film or I didn't kind of use a film it was more clips or kind of documentaries around the video nasties to kind of emphasize points about transgression and things like that but I remember anecdotally kind of hearing about the other module that I mentioned and um, which I which I don't actually teach on or didn't I teach on at the time that case studies and censorship where the lecturer was kind of um streaming um, various films and obviously you've got sequences of really sort of brutal sexualized violence um, and it's making me think and it was a kind of a point made earlier about students not necessarily watching films together and it's just making me think about watching content like that even if it's in an educational context but kind of in isolation as well um, and 
I don't necessarily think, again, anecdotally, that that was taken into consideration in the ways that it should have been, because I had a few students who would come to my lesson and be really kind of, you know, online through Collaborate or whatever, really sort of, you could sense they were shell-shocked even via a webcam, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of like that. that's just something that's coming to mind now that maybe, maybe I wasn't necessarily as mindful of um, during that period. Um, so again, it's kind of linking to what, what some of the discussions were before. Um, but yeah, something to think about. Definitely something to think about. Yeah, sorry. Should we... Um... <laughs> Laura, should we should we invite audience questions while I ask the next one, just so we've got them coming in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't think we're going to have time to get through all of our questions. In all honesty, um, okay. I think yeah, I think um, we if we if we invite audience questions, by all means, if you've got questions, <coughs> bring them in now. And I think um, I think Craig wanted to wanted to ask something. So if you want to ask yours, Craig, and and before you do that, I'll just preempt that mine was about teaching practice based students. I think we've talked about that quite a lot um, mm. a across the course of the morning. Um, and really, so I'll just make a very quick point that for me, one of the benefits of teaching um, practice-based students is their enthusiasm for the material and also that I get to learn from, from students. But I also wanted to talk about the challenges of teaching uh, practice-based students. And, and one of those is, is, is engaging them. So I think we've talked a, a lot of ways about sort of how the examples and the case studies we select can, can be applied in that way and, and can, you know, act as kind of inspiring or interesting or exciting examples for students um but I'll, I'll leave that one there um and let Craig ask his question well no I completely agree with you actually and that does link to the next question we're going to go on to which is um you know uh, it seems like we're all speak we're all using horror films that speak to social cultural political issues that have Im importance above and beyond film media studies so is there something about using horror case studies that's particularly useful to start for starting those kind of discussions and I suppose what you've just said there Laura you know it in terms of talking to practice the practical students production students about how to how to make movies well these are horror films are so often films that have got something to say um uh, and for my purposes that's that's one of the reasons why i use them because they've so often got something to say about about race about class about gender um and i think that's really important but i think i talked a fair bit about that in my talk so i'm going to hand over to you guys uh to to, to say some more about that and um, well uh, what i was going to say was really kind of what Lindsay is saying in the chat there that horror text are a useful sort of route in to talking about stuff but otherwise you know let's talk about racism today you know you don't really want to start a lesson with that but to use a film or a horror text means that these discussions can sort of start to bubble open open in, into a seminar and give students a a tool with which to discuss some topics that are sensitive either personally or, or culturally or whatever and I think it might be, I think we will see horror becoming increasingly useful for students who are coming into university now who have just been through an international trauma of a pandemic and being able to use horror to talk about how they felt anxious, isolated, alone, worried, afraid of bugs and germs. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a route in, I think, for students to talk about things that they might not necessarily have the language to, to, to say. Yeah, I agree. And I think sort of tying into what Laura was saying as well we what I tend to find with the, our production students is that you give them readings and they're like oh no I can't read that but if you give them kind of very short journalistic kind of articles they're a bit more willing to read them or to like cast an eye over them and I think relating to what Stella was saying you know there's been a lot of journalistic articles recently especially during the pandemic about horror so that kind of gives you a nice other little in way to say all right I'm not going to make you read this 30 page chapter but have a look at this and then we can talk about that like as a seminar activity or something and the genre of course lends itself to to kind of contemporary concerns around kind of viral viral contagion and and the spread of disease and body horror and all sorts of all sorts of other stuff grief I think you know a, a really kind of um really kind of key cultural touch points at the minute which which the the genre deals with really well Anecdotally, when um, lockdown happened, so I was teaching the day that the first lockdown happened, um, and that day I was teaching Wreck, which is about a kind of virulent virus ripping through an apartment block for anyone that hasn't seen it, and that was the strangest content warning that I have had to give, because it's like, okay, so you know this is going on in the real world, we're going to watch a movie kind of about that, if anyone doesn't want to watch that, you can leave, so that was really strange. 
I think in terms of again like teaching research and things like that I think the more not necessarily try to consciously move away from kind of talking about the political undercurrents of various films but like in my own work it always seems to be there kind of underlying it's something that I don't think necessarily that you can kind of get away from and I think the point was made earlier you know you can teach these films like genre cinema as genre cinema but also kind of highlighting whatever kind of concerns are going on um, either contemporaneously when those films were made, but also kind of how they reflect kind of anxieties more so now. Um, and again, just anecdotally, I remember having this discussion with with you guys, actually, I think when the pandemic uh, hit and, and when we were kind of going into whatever stage of lockdown, I think I was teaching, it was it was teaching the, the popular culture and context module that was the focus of, of my, pay, my chapter uh, paper paper today i was gonna say chapter there it's not a chapter anyway you know what i mean um in that i think it was a, a trauma kind of studies week um using adam lowenstein's work but it was when the film contagion was kind of resurging on all these kind of streaming platforms and kind of i remember talking to you guys about what should should I use this? Is it is it too close to what's actually going on now? Is the is the horror outside outweighing anything which we could kind of talk about um, at at the moment? You know, because it was a really sort of immediate kind of thing. Because it was literally, I think it was the week after we were all kind of learning from home or whatever it was. You know, so I think it was it was really interesting. I think I did kind of opt to use it, um, maybe against better judgment from some of the. The squad, the squad as we are known, uh, squad members. But there we go. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of it's interesting to kind of think about how these things work in cycles as well. Like I think looking at the program, I'm really looking at uh, lo looking forward to the paper later on about ecological horror in upstream color. Um, so yeah, stuff like that is is really interesting, really engaging, and kind of points to the plur the plurality of kind of interpretations that we can get from these movies as well. Um, I feel like I'm rabbiting and rambling, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, some really interesting responses to that question there. We've got like three minutes left, haven't we, Laura? So maybe... <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, I haven't actually seen any questions in the chat, but maybe if Kate wants to reappear, and if anybody does have a question, now's your time if you get in quick. <laughs> I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> so if no one else has got a question, I can ask me. It was... It was um, to specifically to Craig but I mean all of you could you know be interested in all of your thoughts on this and that is Craig I just thought it was fascinating the, the task you know for, and the focus on short films and it made me think back to um uh, the Bath Sig event uh one before last where um I think it was Prano Bailey Bond was talking about the fact that short films in particular are an important showcase for female horror filmmakers um, and I wondered if that was another benefit of, of focusing on short films, that it opens up a kind of wider diversity of voices in terms of horror production as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I try to use a 50-50 balance of male and female filmmakers on, on everything now, if I possibly can. And it's much easier with shorts because the, the short film world is just more open to, to, to women filmmakers at the moment. I mean, I, I think that is changing. I mean, I was looking at my... Um, I was putting together some arbitrary list of sort of 25 films I loved in 2022 and and a good portion of them were, were were by women simply because I've been able to see more films by women because I think there are more opportunities now but certainly in in terms of short films yes it's a way of being able to show a wider diversity of, of filmmakers um there's a, there's one I, I really want to use in future that I, I just saw at the Abattoir Film Festival um which is by a Jewish filmmaker for example and is about kind of contemporary Jewish trauma um and I think that uh, yeah you certainly do get a wider range of voices in short filmmaking uh, and especially on the on the festival circuit I think the closer you get to Hollywood and the mainstream the less diverse things get definitely brilliant thank you Craig um any other thoughts on that or any other quick questions from anybody there's an enormous amount of valuable comments fascinating comments in the chat so thank you to everyone for 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 all of your thoughts and and the sharing of your experiences as we've been going along I think we'll we'll finish this. So thank you to all of you for an absolutely fascinating panel, which covers such a wide range of really important issues there. Um, you know, trigger warnings, of course, is something, as Laura said, that we'll continue to discuss and, and sort of developing from some of the things that you've discussed here.